Super Smash Bros. Melee, one of the greatest games of all time. Not just because it's Nintendo's best in four-player action, it's scandalous teen rating, or because it's an all-star brawl. Huh. But because it's also one of the deepest competitive games to ever exist, with a dedicated community that survived for two decades and counting from little more than just the love of the game. It's easy to see why. Not too long ago, we witnessed history in the making when Mango clutched a game 10 against Zane to win Smash Summit 11, finally taking gold in the tournament series that had eluded him for so long. Story so inspiring makes you want to pick up a controller and show the whole world what you got. But I don't want to lose 10 tournaments in a row before I finally get my glory. I want to win now, or at least I should know what I'm getting myself into. And so today, we're going to be answering the question, just how long does it take to get good at Melee? But in order to know how long it takes to get good at something, we must first define what it means to be good. But good is a relative term. To my parents, I'm not just good, I'm great. To Tinder, I'm bottom tier trash. So who's right? Well, it depends who you ask. Am I good if I can wave dash or do I have to beat someone notable? Must I force dock children on unranked, or can I simply pay my colleagues until they tell me what I want to hear? Some may call that bribery. I call it a mogul move. If you were to make a scale from worst to best, good will always fall somewhere in between. But we need to be objective here. And if I want to be objectively good, I must meet everyone's personal threshold for good. If there's anyone who wants to question whether or not I'm good, I need to be able to squash that doubt with a money match. So if I want to be good, I have to be the best. In a perfect world, I'd be able to time travel to 2004 where I'd body that red Marth and move on to lose to all the other time travelers. But alas, the world is not that way. It's hard to cheat on LAN and a frat house bathtub full of Adderall still wouldn't be enough to drug my way to the top. No, whether it's Arduino mods or gamer steroids, there's no shortcuts in Melee, but there is statistical analysis. What better way to get good at something than to follow in the footsteps of those who came before? I've compiled a list of all the players who, at some point in time, had a reasonable claim to the throne of best in the world. And we're going to take a look at how long it took for them to get good, so we can extrapolate the data for all of us. Now look, this list of names is probably not complete, and I'm sure you all love to tell me how wrong I am in the comments, and please do, by the way, the engagement is very helpful. Was Isaiah ever number one? Well, I don't think so, and I'm not making an exception for whether or not he was trying. What about somebody like Bomb Soldier? Well, I don't fucking know. I'm not Japanese, and the wiki that I'm pulling all this data from only lists two tournaments for him. But as you'll see, all this older data won't really matter too much in the long run. So who was the first best in the world? Well, that's none other than the King of Smash himself, Ken whose first recorded tournament was TG4 in January of 2003, which he won. So that makes him the best, right? <laughs> of course not, you stupid bastard. As we all know, winning just one tournament isn't enough to crown yourself the king, and certainly not against those schmucks. So we'll go with the first tournament where Ken had to beat the top East Coast talent at the time, which was TG5 in August later that same year. This means our first best melee player finally became the best after a mere 196 days. But Ken started playing melee at the inception of its competitive scene. There was a lower bound on when he could even start to become the best. When MKLeo won his first Ultimate Major two months after the game's release, does that mean it only takes two months to get good at Ultimate? Before I answer that, speaking of Ultimate, Mewtwo King, everyone's favorite Chain grabbing, frame data recording, Chicken McNugget demanding multi-game specialist. His first recorded tournament was Getting School 2 in June of 2005, where he placed last. Now his first major win was Cataclysm 3 in March of 2007, but as we've already established, just one win isn't good enough, so we'll go with Evo East, which happened three months later. Now, as a quick aside, Ken was really only entering locals in 2007, so it's kind of hard to pin down when exactly Music King became the best, especially because Evo World 2007 happened three months after Evo East, where Ken won 
and Mewtwo King got ninth, with a loss in pools to Mango, who got third. But that was Ken's last big win, and that ninth place finish would remain Mewtwo King's worst for the next five years. So, much like my grandfather's rants at the Thanksgiving table, I'm just going to ignore all of that and say that Mewtwo King took 702 days, or a little over two years, to become the best. That's over three and a half times as long as Ken. For my own sake, we might be seeing a worrying trend. Next up, the goat, the buster, the kid. The 30-year-old kid, Mango. According to the Smash Wiki, his first recorded tournament was UCLA Monthlies 2 in March of 2007. Now, when people think of Mango's rise to dominance, they think of his legendary Pound 3 Losers run, where he beat all the top talent at the time, including Mewtwo King in Grand Finals, who, in an act of desperation, decided to do Puff Dittos against the one Puff main. Some things never change. But I don't want to use Pound 3 for this. It was only Mango's first national win, and like those who came before, he must also prove himself once again which he did a year later at ROM 1. This means that Mango's rise to the number one throne clocks in at 715 days, or just 13 more than Mewtwo King. Now, next on the list you might think is Armada, and although he was certainly the best in Europe rather quickly and for a very long time, he actually struggled competing in the US for quite a while. So in Melee's time-honored tradition of disrespecting Europeans, we'll come back to him later and instead talk about Professor Pissboy. Oh, my bad, it's actually Dr. PP, which isn't any better, so I'll just stick with PPMD. His first recorded tournament was Tipped Off 4 in January of 2009, where he placed fourth. Not too long afterwards, Mango went to prison, and a starry-eyed Mario main took his place, leaving room for PP to rise up in his absence. And although his first big win was at ROM 3 in late 2010, the tournament that really solidified him at the top was Pound 5, in February of 2011. This puts PP's journey to the top at a clean 765 days, or just 50 more than Mango. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize one of PP's regular doubles partners, whose tag is Everlasting Yeas. I don't know if that has anything to do with Chudat, but regardless, that name puts terrifying images in my head, and I had to also burden you with those thoughts. Now we should talk about Armada, the Swedish sniper, whose first tournament was Stockholm Sweden 1 in January of 2007, which was in Sweden. And of course, his first tournament in the US was Genesis in 2009, nearly winning it too, until Mango landed the greatest roll read of all time, cementing Mango in America as a bond stronger than Marth Mains in the Sea Stick. Now, Armada's first major win was Genesis 2 in July of 2011, and while I'd like to use Apex 2012 as the tournament he became number one, I'm gonna stick with Genesis 2, as he had been a top threat for a pretty long time, and this was the start of a win streak that continued until his first retirement. And while some may criticize Armada for retiring again and pursuing a Twitch stream, I like to think of it as a melee player's pension. God knows you'd be laughed out of the bank if you tried to open a 401k with your Evo payout. But I digress, as we finally broke it into four figures with Armada rising to number one in 1,655 days. For the next couple of years, the title of number one would be passed around between Armada, Mango, and sometimes Peepy. The heir of the five gods was called that for a reason, after all, and was so ironclad that only a Machiavellian, narcissistic psychopath could take it down. Luckily, we've got Leffen, whose first recorded tournament was Stig, I guess, in July of 2010. Now, knowledgeable watchers will know that Leffen was never officially ranked number one, but I want to acknowledge his accomplishments, mainly because I don't want him to tweet at me, but also because he had an impressive run of wins in the summer of 2015, which was tragically cut short when he got 5 0 by Obama at the U.S. border. Although his big win started with CEO 2015 in June, I'm gonna go with What the Fox in July, putting Leffen on the board at 1,824 days. Yeah! Is that a rabid gorilla I hear? Oh, no, it's just Hungrybox, who's been playing since June Gigabits in June of 2007. 
And although he's one of the five gods and was a top player for many years, I can't really say he was number one during that era, although he did have some very nice wins in 2010 at CEO and Apex. But there's no denying that he was the best from around 2017 to 2019. But which tournament sealed the start of that dominance? Well, like Ninja King vs. Shroom, I've got to change the rules and go with the iconic EVO 2016. While that didn't make him the best, it was a sign of things to come, and don't worry, this data point is already the biggest outlier. How big? Well, almost double the previous at 3,312 days. And finally, we have Zane, who was playing for quite a while before seeing a meteoric rise to the top, just as half the gods and other top players stopped playing. His first tournament was an unnamed local in October of 2014. Like Leffen, Zane was never officially ranked number one, but he made a pretty good case for it in 2020, which of course was when COVID started, leaving Zane without a chance to fully prove himself. That is, until Fizzy descended from the hexagonal blue heavens above like a guardian angel and bestowed upon us a way to play Melee Online. After which he would continue getting gold, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mango and arguably edging him out, most notably at Smash Summit 10 in November of that year. We can argue all day about whether or not online results are valid and while Hungrybox vs. Harry Poggers certainly casts some doubt, there's no question that Zane is one of the best players to ever touch a controller. So our last number one player clocks in at 2,241 days. And that's all the data we need. We can quantify everyone's start date by converting them to the number of days since Melee's release and make a scatter plot with those numbers against the number of days it took for each player to get good. Which leaves us with this abomination. That's hungry box up there, but even with such sporadic data, it's still possible to draw a line of best fit, which looks something like this. Which I thought was going to be exponential, but the good news is, is actually logarithmic. Now all we need is the equation for this line, which is 827 times the natural log of D of S minus 4,810. If you plug in for DFS the number of days since Melee's release that you started playing, you should get back the number of days until you're expected to get good. If you started your journey today, you should be good by the end of 2028, or about seven years. So, it's only a matter of time. But actually, we're not done yet. You see, I started playing around January of 2016, and plugging that into the formula gives me 2,262 days, which works out to April of next year but I'm not good now and I'm not gonna be good in the next few months, so there's something missing here. The truth is some people are just more naturally talented than others and we need to account for that. And we can do so by using what I'm calling the scrub coefficient. To get that, you need your scrub number. I have created a checklist of 10 less than ideal things that may happen in one's melee career and the number of items you check off will be your scrub number. But what's on that checklist? Well, first, going 0-2 in a double elimination bracket. A rite of passage of sorts for most melee players, and a wake-up call to let you know that the friends you used to destroy were little more than bottom-feeding invertebrates in the melee food chain. Next, getting reverse 3 0 one of the most soul-crushing ways to lose because it means that you fucked up and choked a massive lead that was yours to lose. Third, we have switching characters at least three times in a set, and still losing. If your main and secondary couldn't do it, your tertiary was dead on arrival. Check off box number four if you've ever been four-stocked on your counter pick in a winning matchup. Now, it's possible that your opponent was simply way, 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 way better than you, but if it wasn't recorded and no one saw it, did it really happen? Yes. Check it off, you imbecile, we're doing science. Moving away from in-game tragedies, we have fumbling hand gestures. If you've ever screwed up a handshake, fist bump, rock, paper, scissors, or so on, check this off because the set begins the moment you arrive at the setup, and if you can't get the IRL part right, you're already behind. Next, getting DQ'd because you were late on a food break or just forgot when your pool started. Punctuality is the cornerstone of any champion, 
That is, of course, until you become a top player, at which point you can show up whenever you want. But you're not Wizrobe, so be on time. Check off box number seven if you've ever experienced hand pain from playing. Hand pain, of course, is the receding hairline of Smashers, aside from actual receding hairlines. If you catch it early, you can potentially stop it in its tracks, but even with Propecia, still all roads lead to Carpal Tunnel. If you've ever been the cause of salt-induced property damage, box eight is for you. Whether it's spiking your controller or punching the wall, your mentality is shit and will hold you back. Note that in the instance of a box eight event, box five does not apply to the opponent. Check off box nine if you've ever considered switching to commentary full time. This is your brain's way of telling you that it's given up and you're gonna have a tough time convincing yourself that you still got it. And finally, we have a boomer tax. If you are over 30, you have to check this off because you are frail and dying and soon to be old enough to conceive the child who just tech chased you. And that's all 10. To find your scrub coefficient, use the formula one minus your scrub number over 10. If you're a brand new player, you're given the benefit of the doubt with a coefficient of one. If you're somebody like the Crimson Blur who may have checked off all 10, that gives you a coefficient of zero and I have some very bad news. Now we can add the scrub coefficient to our equation from earlier, giving us our final equation, d of g equals 827 times the natural log of d of s over your scrub coefficient minus 4,810. Try it for yourself. If you or anyone else wants to know when you'll finally be good at this game, just use the formula and you can rest easy knowing that science has your back. Me, I've got a scrub number of six, which gives me a coefficient of 0.4. Plugging that into the formula gives me 12,870 days, or 35 years until I'll be good at melee.